Hello, I'm Reverend Ruth Van Lillian. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of the Emerald Coast. We are a covenantal community founded on loving kindness and a common devotion to our free faith. We recognize all the earth as sacred ground and we welcome each other into this virtual space. We especially welcome those visiting with us today. We are so glad you are here. We invite you to check our website and Facebook page to learn more about us. We hope to touch hearts, teach minds, challenge spirits, and comfort souls. May you find refreshment and restoration in our service today. We light our flaming chalice as a beloved people, united in love and thirsting for restorative justice. May it melt away the tethers that uphold whiteness in our midst. May it spark in us a spirit of humility. May it night ignite in us radical love that transforms our energy into purposeful action. This is a chalice of audacious hope. This chalice shines a light on our shared past, signaling our intentions to listen deeply, reflect wisely, and move boldly toward our highest 
ideals. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me to that land. Come and go with me. Hello again. When I used to teach about slavery and segregation, my first graders would be absolutely astounded to hear such a thing had ever happened. They weren't just amazed, but they were angry. You mean I couldn't play with these kids around me just because of the color of our skin? And who made up those crazy laws? They just couldn't believe it had ever happened. And I'm really glad that for them, a lot of those walls and barriers have come down, but they're not all down. And I have a story for you called The Other Side about bringing down fences. I need to share my screen. I do have the pictures for you on a PowerPoint. So there we are. That summer, the fence that stretched through our town seemed bigger. We lived on a yellow house on one side of it. Oh, I guess it's back there. White people lived on the other side. And Mama said, don't climb over that fence when you play. She said it wasn't safe. That summer, there was a girl in a pink sweater. Each morning, she climbed up on the fence and stared over at our side. Sometimes I stared back. She never sat on that fence with anybody. That girl didn't. Once, when we were jumping rope, she asked if she could play. And my friend Sandra said no without even asking the rest of us. Move my picture up out of her face. I don't know what I would have said. Maybe yes, maybe no. That summer, everyone and everything on the other side of that fence seemed far away. When I asked my mama why, she said, because that's the way things have always been. Sometimes when me and mama went into town, I saw that girl with her mama. She looked sad sometimes, that girl did. Don't stare, my mama said, it isn't polite. It rained a lot that summer. On rainy days, that girl sat on the fence in her raincoat. She let herself get all wet and acted like she didn't even care. Sometimes I saw her dancing around in puddles, splashing and laughing. Mama wouldn't let me go out in the rain. That's why I bought you rainy day toys, my mama said. You stay inside here, where it's warm and safe and dry. But every time it rained, I looked for that girl. And I always found her somewhere near the fence. Someplace in the middle of the summer, the rain stopped. When I walked outside, the grass was damp and the sun was already high in the sky. And I stood there with my hands up in the air. I felt brave that day. I felt free. I got up close to that fence and the girl asked me my name. Clover, I said. My name's Annie, she said, Annie Paul. I live over yonder, she said, by where you see the laundry. That's my blouse hanging on the line. She smiled then. She had a pretty smile. And then I smiled. And we stood there looking at each other smiling. 
It's nice up on this fence, Annie said. You can see all over. I ran my hand along the fence. I reached up and touched the top of it. A fence like this was made for sitting on, Annie said. She looked at me sideways. My mama says I shouldn't go on the other side, I said. My mama says the same thing, but she never said nothing about sitting on top of it. Hmm, neither did mine, I said. That summer, me and Annie sat together on that fence. And when Sandra and them looked at me funny, I just made believe I didn't care. Some mornings, my mama watched us. I waited for her to tell me to get down from that fence before I break my neck or something, but she never did. I see you made a new friend, she said one morning. And I nodded and mama smiled. That summer, me and Annie sat on that fence and watched the whole wide world around us. One day, Sandra and them were jumping rope near the fence and we asked if we could play. I don't care, Sandra said. And when we jumped, Sandra and me were partners the way we used to be. When we were too tired to jump anymore, we sat up on the fence, all of us, in a long line. Someday, somebody's going to come along and knock this old fence down, Annie said. And I nodded. Yeah, I said. Someday. That's the end of the story. So you know what our job is? We have to keep working on knocking those fences down because we don't need to keep them separating us when the people on the other side are just as fine a people as we hope to be and we wanna all be together. So something to think about. Help me knock down some fences. Thanks for listening, bye. As we consider the joys and the concerns of our community, let us take a few moments of silence together and then I will close us with some words from the Reverend Theodore Parker. Be ours a religion which, like sunshine, goes everywhere. Its temple, all space. Its shrine, the good heart. Its creed, all truth. Its ritual, works of love. Its profession of faith, divine living. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be. Our fellowship and our community need our financial support. If you're a member or a friend, old or new, you can send in your pledge or other contribution by check 
or online at uufec.com. Our fellowship also has a tradition we call Share the Plate. Every Sunday, the cash offering and the collection plate would be split evenly between the fellowship and a local charity. Online donations to Share the Plate are split in the same way. During the month of January, Share the Plate donations will be shared with Sharing and Caring of Fort Walton Beach. Sharing and Caring is an emergency food bank providing food staples, personal care items, and vouchers for prescription medications for needy individuals and families. Thank you for your generosity. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke those famous words in his commencement address to the graduates of Wesleyan University in 1964. He was paraphrasing a portion of a sermon written in 1853 by the Transcendentalist Unitarian minister and abolitionist, Reverend Theodore Parker. In that sermon, Parker wrote, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The ark is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. In this declaration of faith, both men were asserting in different centuries their respective beliefs that the work of liberation for the oppressed, and specifically for the oppressed persons of African descent, would not and would never be in vain. While the wording may seem to imply that justice work is unnecessary because the realization of justice is inevitable, I am sure that is not how either man intended it. The path toward justice is long, circuitous, and treacherous. Many have spent long lives fighting for it in their time and place and have died without seeing realization of the goals they held dear. I imagine Dr. King and Reverend Parker would be elated to see how far toward justice we have come and I imagine they would also weep to see how far there is yet to go. When Martin Luther King Jr. came to Birmingham, Alabama in April of 1963 and found himself imprisoned for his leadership of the movement there, he wrote a long letter to his fellow clergy who criticized him for being too extreme and too impatient for justice. In that response, he wrote, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park and see the tears welling up in her little eyes when she is told that Funtown is closed to colored children and see the depressing clouds of inferiority begin to form in her little mental sky and see her begin to distort her little personality by unconsciously developing a bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking into agonizing pathos, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. I attended an event for student dialogue a few years ago at the University of Alabama on the topic 
of Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy. I was fascinated to hear the students, black and white, talk about their common experience. The only two black people they remembered studying in elementary school were George Washington Carver and Martin Luther King Jr. And in high school, they added President Barack Obama. They knew bits and pieces of the history of segregation, but the Civil Rights Movement happened so long ago. They take for granted a university where all students are welcome. We talked a bit about George Wallace's speech in the schoolhouse door, followed by Vivian Malone's and James Hood's triumphant walk in to register for classes. To them, it is ancient history, distant and unreal that they are all accustomed to existing side by side in school is wonderful and it warms my heart. Everyone is learning, eating, drinking, living in the same halls together and it certainly seems a vastly different world from 50 odd years ago. I asked them what percentage of the student enrollment is black. The white students didn't know the black students told me 20 percent. The university posts on their website the figure of 12 percent of students self-identify as African American and 82 percent as white. While that is less than half the percentage of the state's black population, it lines up with recent national demographics for college student populations, 13 percent black and 77 percent white. When I asked about the racial demographics for faculty, none of the students had an answer and I was unable to find the info for recent years. There was an article from 2010 that listed figures of 84 percent of the faculty were white and 5 percent were black. Such data are indicators of the distance both our country and that university have traveled in 50 years. From total segregation to this racial mix of the student body, we have come a long way. The faculty demographics are lagging, and I would guess the administrative demographics would indicate a similar lag. I told the students at our dialogue table to look beyond where the university takes in its money and look where the money is spent to get a fuller picture of the progress made and the work yet to be done. Demographics and other data will only take us so far. Remember this story which started going around in the year 2000 that there are more black men in prison than in college? Well actually that was not factual in 2000 and it still isn't. The data were grossly misrepresented to support an agenda and many took it up unquestioningly and ran with it. What is factual is that there is a disproportionate number of black persons imprisoned for relatively small drug related crimes who often get longer sentences than white defendants. Sometimes this has to do with poverty and the inability to get a good lawyer, and a lot of it has to do with racism in our criminal justice system. There are those who desperately want to believe that racial equality has been achieved. I hear from moderate and liberal whites that the battle has been won and it's time to move on. Many are tired of the fight civil rights. Sure, they say, surely we have done enough, right? They have what they wanted. Segregation is long over. Everyone can vote. Look at all they have achieved. Sure, there are still a few problems, but mostly things are good now for them, right? The problem, of course, is that the we implied here are white people and the they are black people. 
And as long as the white people have the majority of the power and resources, we get to say what's okay and done and finished, and they have to take it, accept it, smile, and say thank you for what we have given them. That reality alone is why we are not done yet. As long as our world is still divided along racial lines into we and they, the work of justice is not finished. Listen again to King's letter from the Birmingham jail. I must confess that over the last few years I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klanner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal that you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direst action, who paternalistically feels that he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by the myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. It is so easy to want to set this burden down when we who are white make the mistake of thinking that it is not our burden. If we assume that we white folk, and this fellowship is mostly white, took up the burden of civil rights on behalf of our black neighbors out of the goodness of our hearts, then we have been kidding ourselves. King reminds us that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. If the work of civil rights has been for white comfort or to ease white consciences, then the work is not finished. Civil rights do not belong to white people to then be doled out to black people or other people of color at our whim or will. Civil rights belong to all human beings in their intrinsic, creational dignity and worthiness. As long as persons of African descent feel the slightest anxiety when they leave their homes and venture out into the community, we are not finished. As long as white people go about their daily business unconscious of their privilege, of the greater ease which, with which they engage in their tasks simply because they are white in a culture of white supremacy. We are not done yet. So what next? How do we proceed? Embracing the work yet to be done with renewed commitment is a beginning the contacting of elected representatives, the community work on many fronts where racial inequity intersects with poverty, the fighting of inequities in the criminal justice system, in health care, the marching. These things are the foundational tools of civil rights. And we who are white must dig deeper. 
within ourselves. We must find our own racism for it is there. We must acknowledge our privilege and look for ways to step out of those patterns and surrender power and resources willingly. Living out of this vision of justice will in the end benefit us all. And to those who are African American, who are black and brown, and other persons of color, please don't give up on us white folk. We will keep trying. I want to tell you a true story about something that happened to me recently. And I want you to think and talk together today and in the week ahead about how I might have best responded. I was shopping at a small grocery store and the checkout line looked very long as I approached it with my full cart. A young staff person went to open a second line and called out that the next person in line should come to her register. The next in line turned out to be two young black men and they came towards me as I moved my cart out of their way. When they saw me, an older white woman, they immediately invited me to pull in ahead of them to the newly opened register. I thanked them and without hesitating I turned my cart in that direction. When the staff person saw me turning into her checkout lane she rebuked me mildly insisting that the black men should come in first. I was momentarily off balance. The UU minister in me was really pleased that she, a white woman, was not giving undue privilege to me, that she was standing up for the black men. The tired older woman in me was annoyed that she was questioning my right to go first when the young man had clearly offered me the opportunity. The nice little southern lady in me, accustomed to a little chivalry from men, was worried that I had somehow committed a faux pas by trying to accept the young men's offer. The well-intentioned liberal was afraid I had done wrong and was living out of my white privilege by not insisting that the young men go ahead of me. Now I invite you all to take a moment to consider this real-life scenario and think about the best way you think I could have responded. Now here is what actually happened. In that awkward moment, I turned to look at the young men who were now embarrassed and anxious, and then back at the store employee. Several bystanders were watching as well, which increased my anxiety. I did not want to appear pushy or racist, and generally I obey rules about store lines. They help keep society functioning. However, it occurred to me that part of being equal is having the power to be generous and kind. These young black men were in a position of power, a position that the store clerk was prepared to defend. They did not owe me anything, and they did not have to give up their place in line. They chose to do it without thought to their own inconvenience and, I believe, because their mutual instinct was to be kind to older ladies. I doubt my race made much difference to them in that moment. So I told the clerk that the young men had invited me to go ahead of them, and she apologized, which was not necessary. I got in line and began unloading my cart while the two men pulled in behind me. We smiled and nodded at each other, and I thanked them for their kindness. That was the end of the interaction. If you disagree with my assessment and my choices, that's okay. I'm still questioning myself and I welcome your input. We can discuss it more in the Zoom after the service. But you could send me an email or a text if you'd like to talk further. We must all pay more attention and strive to listen, to learn, and to grow in our work for justice. Sometimes we will make mistakes. Old habits are hard to break, and for we who are white, 
White privilege is the air we breathe, the water we swim in. We are often unaware. Lack of awareness is not sufficient excuse for letting our work slide. Everyone in our fellowship has likely taken a moral position on civil rights. But how long has it been since you lived out of that conviction? What have you done lately for the causes of justice? The moral arc of the universe is long, and I do believe it bends toward justice, but I believe it will reach that destination much sooner through our efforts. The world is filled with brokenness and injustice, and those of us with eyes to see and hands to work and feet to march need to get moving. We need to keep reaching. We need to keep bending that arc toward justice. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be. shall overcome when we can truly celebrate the diversity of contributions and talents offered by all people. We shall overcome hatred <clears throat> and prejudice and oppression when we can truly extend our hands to one another in loving acceptance. We shall overcome the past that haunts us now. Living in peace and freedom, we shall overcome the wrongs that have happened and the debts left unpaid. Let us join together in that commitment to overcome. Let us say together, Amen. Siblings and kindred, the arc of the moral universe is long. Let us get to work that we may assist in bending it toward justice. Let us go in peace. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be.